Hey guys, Josh from the Ancient History Guy here. Hello and welcome to all. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Anyways, today we're going to talk about one of my favourite historical figures, Cyrus the Great. Specifically about how he handled a particular problem when he conquered Babylon, and that was returning all of the misplaced Jews back to their homeland. But what were the Jews doing there in the first place? Well, let's get into it. So before we get started on Cyrus the Great, we must first figure out why the Jews were in Babylon in the first place. After all, the Jews' homeland is in Israel, not in the middle of Iraq. If we bring up a map, you can see the distance between Jerusalem and Babylon. It's quite a trek. So to give you guys a bit of history, the Jews and the Babylonians were actually at one point all ruled by the same empire, the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians were basically the masters of warfare. They had revolutionised siege warfare with their dreaded siege towers. More often than not, the aftermath of a siege would be so brutal, I would probably get demonetised talking about it. Needless to say, the mere thought of bringing down an Assyrian army upon your city was enough to convince you not to rebel. The Kingdom of Israel by this time had actually been split in two, with the Northern Kingdom being called the Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom being called Judea. Judea was a client kingdom of the Assyrians, whilst Babylon was basically entirely engulfed by them. Now, Babylon together with the Medes revolted against the Assyrians, mainly due to their harsh and brutal rule. This eventually resulted in the empire's destruction, with the Babylonians and the Medes carving up the empire's lands between them. The Babylonian Empire then became the default power in the region, with the Jews essentially acting as a buffer state between the huge Babylonian Empire and the economically rich Egyptian Empire. Judea would switch allegiances between Egypt and Babylon many times, depending on which side was the more dominant and powerful. Eventually, however, Egyptian victory over a Babylonian army prompted many of the states in the Levant to revolt against Babylonian rules including that of Judea, who refused to pay the tribute they owed to the Babylonian ruler. This rebellion was disastrous, with the Babylonians quickly pacifying Syria and the Levant and then besieging Jerusalem for three years. During this time, the king of Judea actually died, leaving the throne to his son. The city eventually fell three months later, with the Babylonians stripping Jerusalem of anything of value, seeing it as rightfully theirs as the Jews had refused to pay the tribute owed to them. This included pillaging the sacred temple of Solomon, and following the Assyrian method of warfare, a sizeable portion of the population was exiled from their homeland and carried away as slaves to the city of Babylon. Among these were many of the ruling class. The idea behind this was that the Jews could not rise up in defence of their homeland if they were no longer in their homeland. However, the Babylonians still needed a buffer state between them and Egypt, and so the Kingdom of Judea was allowed to remain in existence, albeit way smaller in size. The new Jewish king, despite advice from his advisers, seemed to have not learnt the lesson and once again decided to stop paying tribute to the Babylonians. Sick of this blatant defiance, the Babylonians decided once and for all to remove Judea from the face of the map. Marching down and besieging the cities, the Babylonians finally broke through and ransacked the place, taking all the riches they could find and destroying the very symbol of the Jews' religion and identity, their precious Temple of Solomon. They then once again carted off a large portion of the population back to Babylon, with some estimates saying around 25% of the population was enslaved and taken away from their homeland. Under Babylonian rule, the Jews that remained in Judea were basically in hiding. The assassination of a sympathetic governor, however, convinced many simply to leave for good, with many settling in Egypt. Judea remained somewhat sparsely populated after this, with even the administrative capital of the region being moved from Jerusalem which was all but abandoned to another city. What's interesting about this time though, is that this is the period where many believe the somewhat confusing identity of the Jewish people came into being. For one, not having a cultural spiritual centre meant that to be Jewish didn't necessarily mean you had to believe in the religion. Thus, strangely, the exile actually further unified the Jews as a people slash bloodline, rather than just being linked to their religious beliefs. Thus, Jewish tradition and culture was kept alive even when their religious centres had been destroyed. This, however, was all to change within a few decades. Far away in the Median Empire, a small tribe of Iranians, known as the Achaemenids, had risen up under the leadership of King Cyrus. Together with a mass defecting of Median troops led by Harpagus, they defeated the tyrannical Median king and had began to expand outwards, conquering the Lydian kingdom in Anatolia. Seemingly on a roll, the Persian king began a conquest of Babylonian territories, eventually capturing Babylon after a fierce battle. What's interesting is that Cyrus was seen as something of a liberator. The current Babylonian king had basically disregarded the major religion of the city in favour of his own favourite god. This had caused some tension between him and the highly influential priests, 
Upon entering Babylon, Cyrus sided with the priests, who had influence with the people. This led to the priests and the people hailing Cyrus as a liberator from a tyrannical king, who very quickly disappeared from written record. With the conquest of Babylon, the entirety of the Babylonian Empire came under Persian rule, and so as a result did the bare state of Judea. Cyrus saw this as yet another chance to increase his popularity with the people. Either that or he was simply a nice guy. Cyrus began making preparations for the exiled Jews to return home and even help them rebuild their precious temple. Needless to say, the Jews were delighted with the news, with many beginning to pack and leave almost right away. It would take a few years for the Jews to actually arrive home. The first wave was led by the grandson of the deposed Jewish king, bringing with him around 42,360 of his countrymen with him. Soon after arriving home, the Jews began to rebuild their temple. It would take many years to do so, with the construction of the temple continuing past the death of Cyrus and into the reign of Darius I. The question remains however, why did Cyrus actually do this? One theory is that because of his religion, Zoroastrianism, he felt he could relate to the Jews, who also only had one god. Cyrus was also extremely tolerant of all faiths, noticeably paying his respects to the god of Babylon. However, one must ask whether or not this was all a publicity stunt in order to connect with the people he had just conquered. I find this time frame extremely interesting, not just because it covers one of my favourite moments of Cyrus the Great's life, but also because of its impact on the Jewish people. As much as Cyrus is one of my favourite rulers, I can't help but see the logic and brilliant use of publicity stunts. By giving the Jews the safety of going back to their homeland, he had won over a large group of people. Cyrus won the Jews over to his side, so much so that the Bible talks quite favourably of him, with both the Bible and Jewish sources saying he was anointed by God. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you for watching and listening to our videos. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe if you've enjoyed. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. I've been the Ancient History Guy, and as always, I'll be seeing you later.